So I'm going to talk about New York Harbor as a in, in the adjacent abatements as a case study. A uh, couple literacy principles: New York Harbor and Long Island Sound are geographically unique. New York is one of the world's original coastal megacities. The harbor has been highly modified. The Long Island abatement eutrophication stimulated the limiting nutrient paradigm. The first description of DDT magnification was in Long Island Sound embayments. Uh, Long Island embayments, sorry. And strong water quality gradients with improving water quality are present in New York City. And New York Harbor and Waterway has been key to the development of the city. So the geographic nature of New York uh, Harbor and Long Island Sound. Um, New York Harbor is adjacent to the bite of uh, the Atlantic Ocean. So there's a north-south coastline to the south and an east-west coastline to the east. And so it's right at the juncture of those two um, geographic uh, concentration. Uh, and, and it's situated at the mouth of a major river, the Hudson River, head of a major estuary in Long Island Sound, which is a couple hundred miles long here, and dotted with lots of islands and surrounded by coastal lagoons. Long Island Sound is an estuary in which the largest um, uh, river is not the head of the estuary, but toward the mouth of the estuary. That's the Connecticut River extending all the way up into Canada. So they're both quite unique to, uh, geographically. So New York Harbor is uh, uh, a great geography for a, a safe harbor. There's the Rockaway and, and uh, Sandy Hook here that provides uh, the outer harbor and then uh, Verrazano Narrows and then the uh, upper bay or inner harbor here. So ships can uh, get uh, out of the Atlantic Ocean um, uh, and, and find refuge in, in these uh, waterways. Lots of estuarine resources, Jamaica Bay over here, uh, Raritan Bay, Sandy Hook Bay, Newark Bay, uh, and then Western Long Island Sound. And so there are lots of uh, uh, marshes and embayments historically. Now, um, going back to this map, I'm going to uh, just take four, such a complex area. I'm going to do this with four transects, a, a, a north, you know, all these transects going from west to east. Uh, through Manhattan and Bronx, down at the uh, uh, lower Manhattan, across uh, the um, inner harbor here, and across the Verrazano Narrows. And so these are the transects. You can see uh, the bluffs, the highlands of New Jersey, uh, deep uh, Hudson River with sturgeon and lots of tidal flushing um, and uh, toxicants. Uh, Manhattan, uh, tip of Manhattan Island, and the Harlem River, which is turbid, uh, the Bronx, uh, the Long Island Sound, both uh, East Chester Bay and the Sound proper, uh, with uh, oysters and um, sandier sediments, lots of recreation over to Long Island. And then uh, south going through Midtown Manhattan, that's the Empire State Building here, we can see uh, New Jersey with lots of fill here. So this was, uh, Hudson River was much wider historically and it's been filled both on the New Jersey and the Manhattan side. The Lincoln Tunnel and the Queens Midtown Tunnel going underneath the Hudson River and underneath the East River. East River connecting Long Island Sound with uh, New York Harbor and uh, Brooklyn here with also uh, some um, uh, fill on that coastline. And then uh, the transect uh, uh, through the Statue of Liberty, we see Newark Bay, lots of toxic uh, buildup, uh, dioxins in particular, um, Bayonne, uh, large ship yards here, um, and uh, uh, the, uh, the, lo the harbor, uh, the skyline with Freedom Tower in the background, lots of ferry traffic, uh, lots of fish, uh, turbidity. Um, increasing uh, over on the east side near the East River. We have Governor's Island, uh, the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel, Buttermilk Channel, which used to be very shallow, which is now scoured and deeper because of uh, dredging and, um, and restricted um, flow that uh, causes more scouring, and then Brooklyn. And then finally, the, the southernmost is Verrazano Narrows Bridge connecting Staten Island with Brooklyn. Uh, here we have Arthur Kill and uh, ship uh, activity and, and uh, port development. Jamaica Bay, a very shallow 
uh, coastal lagoon except for dredged areas. It's uh, the home of JFK Airport. Uh, it's also a national uh, park uh, and then the suburb of Queens, or the borough of Queens. So uh, New York is one of these original uh, mega cities. Uh, Tokyo and New York were the two, first two uh, 10 million uh, 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 population 1950 of course lots more have occurred since then it's been highly modified uh, and if we look at uh, uh, Manhattan project in which um, they've looked at old charts and maps and they can see the uh, original outline of Manhattan Island you can see lots of marsh and um, a very skinny narrow tip here which is now all rounded out by uh, landfill uh, so, New York was a very uh, low-lying, marshy area in, in most parts. Uh, so, lots of dredging and filling, lots of dredged um, channels. Now we have massive wastewater and stormwater inputs and various uh, invasive species that have occurred. The water supply into New York uh, Harbor, uh, into the New York metropolitan area, comes from quite quite far. It's up in the Catskills, where these watersheds have been uh, uh, maintained to provide good drinking water and large extensive aqueducts down into New York City. The Long Island Sound Embayment eutrophication story, uh, these are Jamaica Bay here and then this is called Great South Bay and Riches and Shinnecock Bays along the South Shore Coastal Lagoons and um, starting in the 1930s there was a huge program of, of creating uh, duck farms and they always uh, raise the ducks adjacent to water so that they would, they, at the time they felt that ducks needed water and they produced four million of these ducks. And this inlet got uh, got blocked up and they had these huge green tides, these blooms that were um, uh, that came through and it led to the decline of their, their uh, blue point oysters um, and these little green forms were uh, causing real problems in water quality. Uh, and it was because of this inlet being closed off by a large hurricane and then trapping that water and the nu nutrients from the duck runoff. So they got a guy from Woods Hole, a guy called John Ryther, to come down and, and investigate this eutrophication. So Ryther looked at um, this with bioassays. And at the time, this was uh, right after the Lake Erie and the phosphorus ban, uh, everybody was... Uh, focused on phosphorus as a major limiting nutrient and what he showed with these bioassays that, that was the nutrient was stimulated the growth of the plankton was nitrogen not phosphorus and then he followed that up by taking the Atlantis the uh, Woods Hole oceanographic ship and on these three transects out of New York Harbor across the continental shelf into the uh, into the Sargasso Sea and what he saw was that that the um, uh, distribution of nitrogen dropped away much more quickly than that of phosphorus and provided a, a classic paper uh, in science that pointed to nitrogen as a major limiting nutrient for coastal waters. And then uh, another key uh, uh, was in the DDT and this was done out of Brookhaven, uh, a national lab uh, in Long Island and looking at the um, uh, the sampling the various food web along in this part of these embayments here of, of Long Island. They found uh, this DDT bioaccumulation published in Science and uh, of course uh, since then DDT has been banned. So looking at the harbor itself, uh, zooming in on this with some data that we've just recently uh, obtained from the New York Harbor project and, and calculated these scores for water quality scores using the same technique we did for a Long Island Sound report card. What you see are these canals uh, that, that uh, Newport Creek, for example, here, Newtown Creek, sorry, um, and and um, and uh, other places where the restricted water is very uh, degraded water quality. Uh, the best water quality ducking out from uh, Rockaway Point over here by Coney Island. Good water quality, good flushing, you know, from the uh, Coriolis effect, the water coming in from the oceans, very uh, clean, uh, and then uh, poor water quality over in New Jersey. Uh, lots of rivers, the Hackensack, the 
Raritan, the Passaic, come in over here from New Jersey. So they're degree, you know, with lots of runoff. Jamaica Bay, uh, reduced water quality as well, and the western uh, part of the Sound and East River. Um, and that makes sense given the sort of the gradient in Long Island Sound, which is very well flushed from Block Island Sound with large tidal flushing in the eastern and central portions, but as it narrows into the western narrows with the New York City inputs, um, degraded water quality. So some uh, trends, however, this is uh, some uh, trends from uh, the uh, New York City uh, DEP, Department of Environmental Protection uh, data set, and they've sampled here in uh, the Hudson and, and the Upper Bay, and then along in the Arthur Kill here, and you can see uh, combining these data, what, what, what we see is improving dissolved oxygen, both in surface and bottom water, improving bacteria. Uh, of course, this is um, uh, not directly following rainfall where all those numbers shoot up and it's not safe to swim. Uh, declining total suspended solids. And yet, uh, and this is uh, similar to the Chesapeake Bay where um, the transparency, the water clarity based on Seki depth is, is uh, declining even though the suspended solids are improving and in some cases chlorophyll is improving. So there's a little bit of enigmatic water clarity decline that's going on. So this harbor and the waterway surrounding New York have been key to develop New York City. So this ecological diversity and richness around this harbor have supported the economically rich and diverse and vibrant city that New York City represents. The oysters in Menhaden have provided the protein and the crop fertilizer. So oysters, and I'll talk a lot more about oysters in a minute, uh, were key. They did a lot of Menhaden fishing and they used that to fertilize the crops in Long Island where they had their vegetable gardens. Until it became, until they started growing houses instead of crops. Uh, the protected waters made for good shipping. The Hudson River connected eventually to the Mississippi Basin through the Hudson River Erie Canal. And then Long Island Sound was the major entrance into New York Harbor until late 19th century when steam powered dredging made the, the uh, ocean approaches navigable, but the shoaling offshore had prevented that, so people went the back door through um, Long Island Sound. And then the marshes provided great opportunity for uh, not, not only the ecosystem services, but then for land growth, and so there was a lot of filling that went through that. So let's talk about oysters a little bit. You don't think of New York City and oysters much, but there's a good book called The Big Oyster uh, about the, the history of uh, oysters in, in New York. And these are some barges along the Hudson River that were all just oyster uh, 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 restaurants. Um, in Fulton Street, they had these open oyster stands. Oysters were huge in New York City. They were a big part of early development in New York. They're very plentiful. They sustain native populations in the, uh, before the European settlers, and, and they were finally overfished in the 1800s. And so the, the concept is to try to recreate some of this. So there's a, a project called the Billion Oyster Project, which uh, we're involved with. Uh, and it talks, uh, you know, we, we set the setting is that it's a unique, uh, it's a unique setting. We've talked about that. It's a, a diverse city, uh, culturally and economically rich, diverse and vibrant. It's a highly modified uh, harbor with the modified shorelines and invasive species stretched channels. Um, it's got uh, a huge uh, engineering works uh, around it and opportunity to, to, to to change this. So this project's focused on uh, the uh, education program using oyster cages and school groups. And so all those five boroughs, the kids can walk from local schools and or waterways generally within walking distance of most of the schools. And, and so that they can go and start putting those out and put those oysters out. And you can see the numbers here that have been so far um, put out there. And then um, and, and interestingly, the whole concept of billion oyster came from the Horn Point Hatchery, where uh, they, a few years ago, uh, hit a billion oyster spat produced. Uh, so that was the goal for the New York Harbor, picked up on that. And they're even uh, using recycled uh, toilet porcelain um, to uh, 
to put out these oysters, but they put out these bags and then re retrieve them. Um, and so um, one of the issues that uh, really important about New York Harbor, it's, it's, it's vulnerable to inundation and sea level rise because of climate change. And that was really illustrated when Hurricane Sandy came in 2012 with lots of destruction of infrastructure, uh, uh, a few um, a few deaths, and um, and the lack of oyster reefs and natural marshes have, have affected that resiliency. So for integration, for the New York, uh, two good good books I'll recommend: Heartbeats in the Muck and Gotham Unbound. These environmental histories. Uh, of course, I already mentioned the Big Oyster, which is a fun read as well. Um, the precautionary principle, and I think the best example of that is in the water supply. So when New York Harbor or New York City was was looking to uh, develop infrastructure for water treatment, they recognized that if they protected the reservoirs up here in the Catskills, then they wouldn't have to spend as much money in treatment. So they bought up a lot of this land and created these large aqueducts um, that come down into the city. Another, uh, the, the, the uh, Croton uh, watershed and the Catskill watershed, with these huge aqueducts that uh, that, that stream all the water, and, and even in Hurricane Sandy, uh, and it and it's done by gravity feed. So even during Hurricane Sandy, New York had safe, reliable drinking water, uh, even though the power was out. Uh, sustainability and resilience. Uh, so New York City groups bring. Um, we are trying to develop more resilience, and so you, know, you can see some of these uh, shoreline developments that are trying to cope with uh, inundation, sea level rise, get more people out on the harbor. Uh, there's a lot more activity on the harbor these days. Um, you can see that uh, the Sandy uh, had this huge um, pulse of of wastewater that was treated, so a lot of it was untreated, though. So even with this impulsive treatment, uh, there was a lot of raw sewage that ended up in the uh, in the harbor, and, and so uh, lots of infrastructure post Sandy is to uh, to is, is is set up to try to avoid those overflows. So for a quick um, reference, I've got a, a paper that we wrote recently on. Resilience of New York Harbor in the face of four centuries of development, providing some um, uh, environmental history, and I also uh, recommend to you the State of the Estuary 2012 report. Uh, the more recent ones don't have much data, and they're kind of fluffy. But this one's, I think, the best uh, place to go to to look, at, look into some of those trends.